I was there at the dawn of the third age of mankind, January 26th, 1994, the premiere of Babylon 5, Midnight on the Firing Line. My name is Jonathan Wright, and this is Babcom 5. Babcom 5 is sponsored by Hope. The Book of Shaquan explains its importance. There is a greater darkness in the one we fight. It is the darkness of the soul that has lost its way. The war we fight is not against powers and principalities, it is against chaos and despair. Greater than the death of flesh is the death of hope, the death of dreams. Against this peril, we can never surrender. All right, cue up your video and hit play when you hear Kosh say, And so it begins. Joe Straczynski said, Midnight on the firing line just moves like a son of a bitch, hits the ground running and never stops. And he wasn't kidding. From the attack on Rakesh 3 to Sinclair going to sleep, something is happening in every scene. Joe said this was in stark contrast to the pilot in which we had to spend a lot of time in exposition. While there may not be a lot of character examination, there is a lot of character establishment as each of the main characters is reintroduced. Using exact times in the initial establishing shot is a useful device, informing new viewers that these events are occurring simultaneously and letting returning viewers know that several months have passed and things have changed. Midnight features amazing character pairings. Throughout this episode, I'll highlight how these on-screen duos bring Babylon 5 to light. Midnight was filmed one year after the pilot, and some actors had a problem finding their characters' fingerprints, as Joe called them. Peter Jurassic didn't. He would just stand tall and say... It was like his own personal Shazam. The observation dome is periodically on standby mode, when the system is performing automated backups, routine maintenance, etc. When it's on standby, all is quiet, this happens every 36 to 48 hours and lasts about one hour. It should be noted that there are two CNCs and the second is active during the primary standby mode. I like to think that's the one we saw in the pilot with the funky spinning light on the floor. Londo and Garibaldi are one of the classic pairings in B5 and their relationship will provide a benchmark for the changes Londo will undergo throughout the years. In the casino, Londo mentions the Centauri colonies of Beta 9 and Beta 12, which seems odd. Beta is the letter in the human Greek alphabet. Well, that's because the Centauri borrowed the human naming convention for colonies. In the Earth Alliance, small col colonies are named with a Beta designation. So when the Centauri translated the names of these two small fry colonies, they used the designation Beta. Okay, let's talk about Vir Kodo, played by the late Stephen First. Man, we have lost too many cast members. First is, of course, legendary as Flounder on Animal House, but he worked steadily until landing the role of Dr. Elliot Axelrod on Sane Elsewhere. He started as Veer in Season 1, but as Season 3 was gearing up, First got a much larger role in a sitcom called Misery Loves Company. To his credit, Joe modified the role using one of his infamous trap doors, so Veer could leave the station but have the opportunity to return from time to time. The sitcom only lasted one season, and Veer was back on the station later in season three. In September of 93, Joe broke the news that Stuart Copeland would not be returning to do music for the series due to album and tour commitments. Joe had been looking at Tangerine Dream keyboardist Christopher Frank from the start, a German musician who pioneered the use of the analog synthesizer. As Joe said, in addition to being a solid percussion man and a great musician, he's a real techie, up on the latest technologies involving music and sound, and will be able to give B5 a very unique sound. And unique it was. In November 93, Joe first saw this title sequence and said, with the addition of Christopher Frank's B5 theme, the main title is just terrific. A huge step over the pilot, much as I liked some aspects of that music. It's rich, romantic, full, aggressive, and it stays in the mind afterwards. Joe classifies the pilot movie as a who story, introducing us to all the characters of the story, but says that season one is a what season. You find out what the Psychor is, what happened to the Battle of the Line, what happened to Babylon 4, and so far. Season 2 is the why season. 
Why did that happen to Sinclair? And of course, the seasons also generated new questions, which are answered in later seasons. Now compare this philosophy of series structure to those famous questions. Who are you? What do you want? Why are you here? Where are you going? The original working title was Blood and Thunder, but folks told Joe that some wags would refer to it as Thud and Blunder, so it was changed. In 1993, Joe wrote that the first script is, in some ways, the best thing I've ever written. This episode was directed by Richard Compton. As I mentioned in the pilot commentary, Compton was an actor in the 60s and 70s who actually appeared in two episodes of the original Star Trek before switching to directing. Compton directed the pilot film, five episodes of season one, and served as producer during the first season, helping to shape the visuals of the series. Now this is our first view of the new Delenn. Once they decided Delenn was definitely female, they designed completely new costumes for her. The goal was to be exotic but dignified. The facial prosthetics were completely redesigned, softening the appearance while maintaining the androgynous look, and also making them easier to apply. The Earth Force uniforms have greatly improved in the series. In the pilot, only Earth Force crew wore uniforms. Those who were employees of the station wore shirts with patches. Obviously, Earth Force rigs have changed, and now even contractors wear the blue, but they still have B5 patches, not Earth Force patches. And they're not ranked. For the series, the uniforms were toughened up, retailored for a better fit, and of course, that awesome leather panel just makes the whole thing pop. It's very detailed, with bronze clasps, rank insignia, and belt. Joe even had a uniform tailored for himself, on his own dime, of course. There were some complaints when the series debuted that the uniforms looked too much like the kind we wear now, but Joe brings up a good point. Compare today's uniforms, especially dress ones, with those of 200 years ago. They aren't all that different. As he reminds us, there is a strong sense of tradition and history in all branches of the military. Connections between the B-5 future and our present are intentional and intended to show the continuity of the human species. And of course, the most important thing about them is that unlike jumpsuits, these uniforms have pockets. Because as Joe says, in the future, there will be stuff and we will need pockets for our stuff. Another great pairing in this episode. Notice the way Sinclair and Ivanova talk. Susan is upright, proper, literally not a hair out of place. It's clear that Sinclair has told her to speak her mind, and she shows no hesitation to do so. However, she is respectful to her superior officer and does not push the license he's given her. She asks about Sinclair's background only when she's been clearly invited to do so. The commander is relaxed but formal. He's not afraid to be open, and if the point is important, he shares parts of himself that aren't in any dossier. From a story arc perspective, it's less than 10 minutes into the first episode, we already have our first Earthmanbari War reference. This storyline will be critical to the first season. The mystery around its beginning and end, and the role Commander Sinclair played in that ending, will move Year One into exciting and dangerous territory. One of the great mysteries of Season 1 is what happened to Sinclair at the end of the earth Minbari War. Notice the subtle way that subject is introduced here. Ivanova talking about his war experience with the Minbari and his family history as a fighter pilot. Sinclair's advice to ignore propaganda is also one of the mainstays of the series. From the racist lies of Home Guard to the President Clark-controlled ISN, characters in B-5 are bombarded with propaganda, but have no patience for it. Speaking of President Clark, here he is in his series introduction as VP. I think it's very telling that the first thing you hear about Clark is a derogatory statement about his chins. In what may be one of the best examples of one producer sniping at another, Joe wrote an insult about President Santiago having no chin knowing that they plan to use a picture of producer Doug Netter as the president. Although it's come to be recognized as an important symbol of the character, some people at the time had a real problem with Londo's hair. Americans mostly. Although Japanese and Europeans had no problems, us Yanks just couldn't understand why Centauri wore their hair this way. Joe thinks it derives from Americans' near-pathological fear of being made fools of. He said, 
When we see someone who doesn't match our view of what's the norm, we imagine how we would feel in that position. And to make ourselves more secure, as in high school, we make fun of what would personally embarrass us. Wow, is that ever true? You only have to look at the treatment of the hippies in the 60s to see this play out. Conservatives were angered by long hair back then. Or take Star Trek. Paramount in the 60s got as many letters about Spock's hair as they did his ears. Okay, let's talk about the new toys. This is the SA-23E Mitchell Hundine Star Fury. B5 has four wings of 12 fighters each. We'll see them in action later in the episode, but note some of the details here. Each Star Fury has unique nose art, a tradition dating back to the first airplanes used in combat in World War II. Another tradition is squadron patches, which are worn by all pilots on their spacesuits. For example, one of the patches says, Flying Nightmares, B5FA-1013, with the Star Fury motto, Ugly, but well hung. Star Furies dock by entering the central docking bay and are repaired and recharged in the maintenance hangar, and then lowered into Cobra Bays. During production, some wondered why B5 needed fighters at all, considering it has its own defense grid. The events of Midnight make it clear why it's handy to have them available, but you can get more specific than that. The defense grid is good, but not great. Even after it's improved, any of the hostiles encountered by the station could have destroyed it if fighters were unavailable. But more importantly, B-5 is a port of call, which means the transportation lines to and from it must be kept clear. You'll notice here, Jakar's makeup is much thinner. It's not due to budget cuts, as some thought at the time, but rather a desire to make the prosthetics more comfortable and believable. Andreas Katsoulis and Mira Furlan both had new life casts made of their faces and new artists resculpted of the headpieces. Thanks to these changes, Andreas' facial expressions burst out of the makeup, filling the screen and creating a truly terrifying Jakar when he's angered. The problem is that the thinner material tears easier, so they go through far more prosthetic pieces than the old design. By the way, when asked what Spoo tastes like, Joe said, meat jello served chilled. Make of that what you will. The road from movie pilot to TV series was not a smooth one, which will come as no surprise to anyone who knows anything about this series. In February of 92, as Joe and Doug Netter were in pre-production, they were told that they would have to go for series if they met one goal, bringing the movie in on budget. Everyone in the P-10 consortium, that is, Prime Time Entertainment Network, man, what a crappy, crappy name, was in Joe's words, hot and ready for the series. But a couple of bigwigs at WB simply didn't believe they could do what they intended to do with the money they had. They knew ratings would be low compared to network shows, so the ratings weren't that important. At least not then. Flash forward 10 months to the end of 92, and P10 has dropped $25 million in production and advertising before the movie is even out. Joe and company couldn't very well ask for more money to start production on the series, so suddenly everything is riding on the ratings for The Gathering. Fortunately, they got better than they were expected and actually gained more viewerships as the movie continued throughout the night instead of losing it. The pilot was a success, but Joe and the fans would have to wait to know if they were go for series. In his conversation with Sinclair, Londo talks about his famous death dream. It's amazing that this is laid out in the first episode of the series. Here we are, on the first step of a five-year trip, being told how it will end. Joe always tells us the truth, but as with everything, it's all about context. One thing to notice here in Londo's quarters is that his trunks are open and his clothing is scattered. Sure, he's changing clothes at the moment, but most people of Londo's rank and title would have a valet to help him dress. Londo has nobody, and the inconsistency between his title and his means will begin to weigh him down as the season progresses. In April of 93, two months after the pilot debuted, Joe talked theoretically about what he would be doing if the show were a go. He talked about imaginary script meetings and new casting and lots and lots of writing in order to be ready for a start of production in July, theoretically. 
Joe reminded fans at the time that there was a period when Babylon 5 could only be referred to publicly as that which cannot be named until the initial contracts had been finalized. As awesome as Joe Straczynski is as a producer, he is first and foremost a writer. He literally wrote the book on script writing. His complete book of script writing is required reading for film students. And as a storyteller, he has some great yarns about the writing process, such as, you know, every once in a while, I get somebody who comes up and asks what it's like when the writing process becomes easier, and you just want to grab a nearby 2x4 and whack them upside the head real hard. For those who wonder, it never gets easier. But sometimes, a script just sort of falls out of your head and lands on the keyboard. That happens. Midnight and the Firing Line was like that. This shows you exactly how well Joe understood these characters. Just listen to Molari's vow here. It could easily come off as heavy-handed, but Joe's writing and Jurassic's acting make it sound like a simple statement of fact. Okay, let's talk about Claudia Christian and her brilliant performance as Ivanova. Susan Andreovna Ivanova is a Russian Jew born in the Russian Consortium. What kind of Jewish Ivanova is? Orthodox, conservative, reformed? Well, as Joe says, that's something she's trying to resolve in her own head. She has no Russian accent because she was raised abroad, going from school to school as her mother kept her one step ahead of Psychor. That would naturally make it tough to make friends, and no doubt contributed to her rather standoffish personality. Susan joined Earth Force during the earth Minbari War, after the death of her brother, and over the objections of her father. When he introduced Claudia Christian to fans, Joe said that she was a fantastic and very strong performer who just knocked us out of the room. Very much a commanding presence, a little quirky when she wants to be, and a shade on the pessimistic side. Every word would be proven as season one progressed. The alien sector was blown out in the gathering, so it went through a comprehensive redesign. Gone is the alien petting zoo appearance. The mystery of what Vorlons really look like is reintroduced here in a shockingly simple but utterly effective way. We hear Kasha's voice for the first time officially here, pilot movie, special edition notwithstanding. Kosh is voiced by Ardwright Chamberlain, a well-respected voice actor with 10 years experience when he came into the role. He would record all of Kasha's lines in one day in an audio booth. Joe recounts how Chamberlain liked to stay in character between takes, so while they set up for the next scene, you would hear Kosh saying things like, Bugger off, Sheridan. Have I told you I find you very attractive? And, Oh, the pain, the pain. Here's what Joe said was his initial idea for Kosh's first words in the series. Whether he was joking or not, well, with Joe, you can never tell. Kosh is on the observation dome, looking out through the window as a ship passes overhead, the lights shining down at him. Ah, beautiful. I will miss this when it is gone. He leaves as Garibaldi mutters to Ivanova, I really hate it when he does that. We should let them pass. The Vorlon's attitude is laid out here in episode one. They've seen people come and go, and some must die if all are to be saved. We are all literally chess pieces to them. It's a powerful, definitive moment that will take three years to play out fully. We continue to see Susan's character reveal itself. Very staid when speaking with Commander Sinclair, but relaxed and even bantering with Garibaldi. Some people complained about her abrasiveness when the episode was released, but Joe was quick to call out any such complaints for what they were, sexism. If a man had joked about snapping off Garibaldi's hands at the wrists, nobody would have said a word. We're back in Londo's quarters, but look at the change. His trunks are in disarray, clothes lying about the place. They'll be in this condition off and on over the rest of the season, as Londo's emotional state and sense of self-worth deteriorates. Although they explicitly pointed out in Season 3, you can see hints in Season 1 that nobody takes Londo seriously, especially in the Centauri Royal Court. Even though he looks impressive, his costume is intricate, lots of medals, scarab jewels on the shoulders, designed to look regal. It's all show. Londo is on the skids, and as the season progresses, he looks and acts more and more shabby. 
Londo's condition mirrors that of his Republic. As he says here, the Centauri were once the Lion of the Galaxy, but are now reduced to a dozen worlds and a thousand monuments to past glory. In season one, this just seems sad and rather pathetic, a man and his empire slowly going to seed. But those seeds are filled with a dangerous discontent. The average Centauri lives to be about 150, so Londo has many years of regret ahead of him. At the time, some viewers were confused that Londo spoke with a vaguely European accent, and Veer did not. This is no doubt due to the tradition of monocultures in certain other science fiction TV shows and movies. Like humans, not all aliens speak with the same accent. Joe just thought it would be more realistic. However, there is a definite style of accent among the upper crust, a certain old-school accent in the royal court. This moment is an interesting one. Londo has received explicit instructions from the royal court, and yet he is going to go into the council session and lie in order to save face. He's not the only one that's going to lie in that session. Jakar will lie to justify the Narn invasion. Even Sinclair will lie, putting Ivanova in his place in an effort to save the situation for everyone. This was Andrea Thompson's first scene that she filmed in the series, and Jerry Doyle tells how they rehearsed it several times, filmed one take, and then set up for another. So this time, Talia comes down the hall, the tube doors open, and there's Garibaldi with his pants down. Is it any wonder they were married within a year? Is it any wonder they were divorced within two? So, let's talk about Talia Winters, played by Andrea Thompson. Thompson started acting in 1986 and got her first big break on the movie Wall Street, then a recurring role in the last season of the soap opera Falcon Crest, before landing the role of Talia Winters three years later. Afterwards, she had recurring roles on NYPD Blue and JAG before switching to journalism. She worked for CNN for a year and covered the 9-11 tragedy. Her insight into journalism of the time is telling. She said, Basically, you just give the viewers enough to scare the hell out of them and not any real valuable information. And we saw so much of that after September 11th that I thought was, frankly, irresponsible. She left cable news in 2002 and returned to acting. The Narns are very much the new kids on the galactic block, and they have the chip on their shoulder to prove it. They were dominated by the Centauri for 200 years, but eventually drove them off their world through an extended series of low-level guerrilla engagements. At this time, the Centauri Republic was in decline, and Narn was just too far away to justify the expense of keeping. However, there were some major engagements near the end of the occupation, and this fed the myth that it was the open defiance and large-scale attacks that drove the Centauri away. This was a dangerous fiction that led the Narn into a belligerent posture that would lead them into the stars. Using Centauri weapon factories, they armed themselves by strip mining their world, and were so successful they became galactic arms merchants. Those nearby planets not strong enough or rich enough to trade with them have been taken over, and now the Narns are sniffing at the fringe worlds of the Centauri Republic. Jakar's position as ambassador is very different from that of any other. As Joe points out, the Narn idea of an ambassador isn't just someone who speaks for his people, he represents his people on every level. This means Jakar's position is more important to the Narn on the station than Londo's position is to the Centauri. Jakar takes care of many of the needs of his people, just as the government back at home, such as religious ceremonies and direct leadership in a crisis. It's great seeing Jakar bring up this idea that Narn sold the Earth weapons during the earth Bari War. It demonstrates just how massive that conflict was, how scarring, and reinforces the reason why Babylon 5 was created in the first place. This also presents another opportunity for Joe to build up Sinclair and Jakar's good guy, bad guy dichotomy, knowing that soon he will completely invert that assumption. While filming season one, there was some tension between Michael O'Hare and Jerry Doyle. Doyle felt that O'Hare was receiving preferential treatment and acting like a prima donna, not making call times, asking for extra time off, etc. 
What nobody knew was that O'Hare's increasing mental illness was causing the problems, and Joe was covering for him. These strains never showed on camera, and Joe continued to cover for O'Hare publicly. He touted the two actors pairing early in the show's run. Jerry and Michael are a great team, and there are some scenes in which Jerry has to be very serious when he just lights up the screen. And as for Michael, I think that after you've seen what he's doing now, nobody's ever going to use the term stiff again. He's strong and personable and likable, and the character is really coming off strongly. If I had a sponsor, this would be the perfect place for a plug. Back in Sinclair's office, we see him speak with the same unnamed senator from the pilot, one of the fascinating things about speculative fiction is the creator's vision of humanity in the future. Here, the people of Earth have united after World War III, but it's not the gleaming steel of a perfect federation, as Joe calls it. Joe didn't create the Earth Alliance to be all-powerful or homogenous. Even this early on, we see the government's weaknesses in abstaining from involvement in the Narn Centauri conflict. The EA Senate is located at Earth Dome in Geneva, Switzerland a nation famous for its neutrality in all political matters. Senators have two responsibilities. They represent their respective nations in the EA Senate, but are also the heads of their own government. Essentially, the president of every nation or commonwealth also sits on the Earth Alliance Senate. We can assume that this senator represents the North American Federation and is replaced in this election by Senator Cantrell. This system is inequitable in smaller nations, and they complain bitterly that their taxes support B5, but they themselves don't benefit much from it. For example, there is a senator from African bloc, and also South Africa alone. One would imagine South Africa carries far less influence and gets far fewer benefit than its northern neighbor. The Earth Alliance is made up of Earth and the Sol system colonies, like Luna, Mars, the Io transfer point, there are eight major colonies and over a dozen minor ones. Most of these were established on bronze tech worlds, that is, planets with little to no technology, but lots of useful resources. There is no prime directive. These planets get help from the EA whether they like it or not. As Joe says, humans are spreading like mice in a cheese factory. The ports launching the Star Furies are called Cobra Bays because, from the outside, they resemble the head of a cobra. The name references their appearance, not what's inside them. Star Furies are launched through the application of centrifugal force, the inertial force that causes objects moving on an axis of rotation to move away from that axis when what's holding them to that axis is released. When you see a Star Fury drop, it is moving at 32 feet per second, the force of 1g. It doesn't accelerate on its own because it's not being drawn towards anything. This was very carefully worked out by the animators and NASA engineers praised B5 at the time for its constant adherence to realistic portrayals of gravity. Now look at how powerful Susan Ivanova is. At this moment, she is the voice for Earth. So we're introduced here to the Babylon 5 Advisory Council and the League of Non-Aligned Worlds. The League is a coalition of independent worlds far weaker than the Big Five, but who together form a group whose military, political, and economic power matches any of the major powers on the Council. They get a single vote equal to any of the other major powers, but sadly do not work well together, and this tendency to fracture plagues the cause of peace throughout the series. In this episode, we see members of the Pak Mara, the armadillo-like Lort, that's the one who seconds Jakar's motion, and the unfortunate Markab. Notice that the jump point looks different from the pilot. In the pilot, all the jump points were orange, the same color as hyperspace. That changed in the series, with ships entering a reddish jump point and exiting a blue one. The reason is the Doppler shift, sometimes called the red or blue shift. An object moving away from you will have the wavelengths of light stretched, moving the color towards red. An object approaching you will have the light wavelengths shortened, compressing them and shifting the color towards blue. Science! The juxtaposition of these two scenes is the essence of Babylon 5. The show never focused solely on the stereotypical tropes of science fiction. The political aspect was just as important, and at times even more important, than the spaceships and the laser guns. 
Karin Millari is played by Peter Trencher, one of the legions of actors who fill out the supporting roles in your favorite TV shows. He's appeared in dozens of TV shows and still acts today. I love the way the scene is framed. It is so clear that Karn is being prompted, probably even threatened, to say what he's saying. Londo is absolutely right in his statement. The problem, of course, is there's no proof. Jakar is creating reasonable doubt in the minds of the Council, and even though they can suspect the Narns of pulling a fast one, they can't prove it. At this point, Karn's story has just as much validity as anybody else's. There's some deep political philosophy to dig into here. Politics is usually a game of compromises. To quote Catherine Sakai, the dance goes something like this. One side makes a demand, the other stands on its pride, saying they don't give in to demands. Both sides having pumped their egos up a bit, they come back with a proposal. The second council encounters, and they finally meet somewhere in the middle. Both sides come away with something they want, at the cost of something they didn't. But Jakar is not playing that game. He's launching a personal attack on Londo, just as the Narn regime has launched an attack on the Centauri. He's playing for blood, as Londo said earlier, trying to hurt Londo where he feels it most, his family honor and pride. In politics, this kind of attack is incredibly high stakes. If it works, the results can be tremendous, as you see here, but the consequences can be equally horrific, as we almost see at the end of the episode. Jakar is leaving Londo no room to maneuver. He's hunting Londo the way a predator hunts prey. There is no doubt that this tactic will play well back home. The Kari will love to hear how Jakar manipulated the situation to ensure Narn wins the political battle as well as the military one, and the Narn on the station will gain new respect for their ambassador, standing up to the power of the Centauri. The problem with that is, as a political maneuver, it only works if there are no bigger hunters around, and Jakar will learn that Commander Sinclair is a most excellent hunter. There's that great Christopher Frank music sting at the opening of the scene that hits just as the original viewer would have been coming back from commercial, jumping you into our first space combat. While showing footage of Star Fury flight at a convention in 93, Joe heard a member of the audience shout out, F equals MA! First he thought he was a heckler, but what the audience member was shouting was Newton's second law of motion, that the force exerted by an object was equal to its mass times its acceleration. Notice the movement of the Star Furies. It's three-dimensional, making full use of the XYZ axis for ship movement. This was just one of the many compliments given by scientists to the accuracy of Babylon 5. Joe and the production crew agonized over the question of sound in space. Surprisingly, no one has ever put a microphone in space, but Joe spoke to scientists at the National Center for Atmospheric Research's High Altitude Observatory and came to some conclusions. Space is not a perfect vacuum. There's just normally too much distance between molecules to carry vibrations. By this logic, a microphone placed sufficiently close to an explosion or the exhaust of a spaceship's propulsion system would pick up sound for the short duration in which it was covered in those gases. All right, what's Londo up to? Hmm, let's see. Ooh, a secret handle. That looks important. On this show, you can tell the importance of a character by the number of secrets they keep. And like all ambassadors, Londo keeps contraband hidden in his quarters. Ah, an, a secret energy cap hidden away. Amazing what you can sneak onto the station through diplomatic channels. And a cleverly concealed weapon housing. Uh, that diplomatic bag is sure useful. Oh, and what's this? Oh, come on! Seriously? Who the hell would miss that? Jeez, Garibaldi, it's like you want him to shoot someone. Of course, I'm being facetious. The command staff know the ambassadors have weapons. Hell, Veer uses one of Londo's swords on a shopkeeper in Season 5. Sinclair and Garibaldi could lodge a protest, but that would strain diplomatic relations, so they keep enforcement on the down low. Joe is on record as being happy with everyone's performance in the pilot. However, he didn't see a, quote, strong synergy between the characters, which led to some changes. Joe said that Tamlin Tamita, who played Laurel Takashima in the pilot, was a terrific performer, but she wasn't entirely happy with her performance. It's not the kind of role she's really used to playing. 
Although it was not revealed at the time, Johnny Seca left the show due to health concerns. Patricia Tallman was another story altogether. In 1993, Joe said publicly that Pat's rep told him she was passing on the role of Lita in order to pursue other opportunities, but that he hoped he could work with her in the future. It should come as no surprise at this point that this statement wasn't the whole story. Patricia revealed the truth in her memoir, Pleasure Threshold. When you do a pilot, you never know if you are going to have a series, so you shoot a pilot and hope for the best. We were hoping it would go well and get a lot of eyeballs when it aired so that it would get a series order. However, on the Warner Brothers side, there was one guy who didn't like me because I didn't want to sleep with him, and he made sure I got kicked off the series. Joe Straczynski had been out of town for a bit, and he was told by the production office that I had asked for an exorbitant amount of money. What they didn't realize was that Joe and I were friends, as he was with most of the actors. When he got back to town, I gave him a call about how they had kicked me off the show and told him the exact figure what my agent had asked for. That's why in the second season, when Andrea Thompson, who played Talia Winters, decided to leave the show, Joe called me up and asked if I would come back as he had no hard feelings and hoped I did not, and it worked out really well. Another great pairing here. This scene between Londo and Garibaldi is critical to the series' first two seasons. You see here an important change in their relationship. Garibaldi is not just preventing a crime, he's preventing Londo from making a devastating mistake out of anger and frustration. Michael knows how he burns for revenge and what that revenge would cost him. In saving Jakar's life, he's also saving Londo's, and both of them know it. In my secret identity, I'm a high school English teacher, and I use this joke from Garibaldi all the time with my students. I think they see the humor of it. The undoing of Jakar's plans doesn't begin as a pairing, but the final frame of the scene puts him and Sinclair in the same position they were at the end of the pilot, on opposite sides of Narn ambition. The, J the commander knows who and what Jakar is as do we the rear, and of course, we're both completely wrong. As Jakar himself says later in the season, none of us is entirely as we appear. But you can't change people's perception until you've said it, and in Midnight, Jakar appears as he is intended, the nefarious mastermind. Joe was so successful in this that some fans at the time complained about the obviousness of the roles. Jakar was obviously the bad guy, Londo was obviously the drunken bumbler, even though he almost murdered the Narn in this episode? Just like today, some fans jump to a conclusion and stick to it, even in the face of logic and evidence to the contrary. Ivanova and Garibaldi both make strong showings here. Ivanova is stern and commanding in the background, as Garibaldi gets to play hard-boiled detective, revealing to the bad guy how he figured out who done it. Sinclair is passionate and assured, making it clear he will tolerate none of Jakar's schemes on his station. The scene perfectly demonstrates Joe's plan for this episode and the series as a whole. Each episode was designed to stand on its own, but the episode also helps to build the foundations of the world we see and to explore how each character contributes to that world. One last pairing of Garibaldi and Sinclair. They're old friends, and the ease of their conversation makes that clear. Michael O'Hare affects a warm and relaxing attitude when talking with Jerry Doyle that isn't present with his discussions with other characters. Sure, he's friendly with Ivanova and the Ambassadors, but he's still very much in his official position. With Garibaldi, he seems more himself. On the right, Luis Santiago is played by executive producer Doug Netter. Mary Crane is played by costume designer Anne Bryce. Interstellar Network News, or ISN News, plays a very small role in Season 1, but that role will grow as time passes and things get darker. Interstellar means the network can transmit instantaneously from their headquarters in Geneva, Earth, to just about anywhere a jump gate is located. Transmitting through hyperspace requires a tremendous amount of energy, so the network is expensive to run. The only way they survive is because, as Joe says, they are very much in EarthGov's pocket. This becomes all too clear when Clark orders the network nationalized and its reporters arrested. ISN doesn't just offer news, as we see later, there are channels for entertainment, sports and leisure, and even adult content. 
My reference to adult content it was not meant as a segue to Ivanova and Talia's relationship, because it is surely one of the more mature and complicated ones in the series. Talia is one of the friendliest and warmest telepaths we will ever see, and compared to the Ivanova we've witnessed so far, seems far more approachable. But of course, not everyone is exactly as they appear. We learn about Talia's upbringing, raised by the Corps to be a true believer. Her encounter with Susan is the first time she sees another side of the organization, and the framing of this scene is breathtaking in its simplicity. As this scene begins, uh, you can hear pop music and talking in the background, just two women having a quiet conversation at a bar after a hard day's work. When Ivanova reaches the part of the story where Sycor catches up with her mother, on her 30th birthday no less, the sound changes, the music drops, and an om ominous atmospheric tone begins, the sound of a great chasm opening up underneath you. It's the sound that swallowed Susan's mother. It's the sound that filled Sophie Ivanov's mind and heart until she could no longer stand it. It's the sound of a great empty inside Susan's heart, which will never be filled. It's the sound of Psychor. Science fiction is at its best uh, when it doesn't talk about aliens and spaceships, it talks about us. It talks about the human condition. One of the great questions asked by B5 is, what would we do as a culture if we discovered people could read our minds and there was nothing we could do to stop them? Obviously past laws criminalizing uninvited intrusion, but what if it were an accident? What if the person had no control over the ability? Look at it from the telepath's point of view. If you are walking past someone talking loudly, can you honestly be angry at them for hearing you? They didn't want to hear what you said, they're trying not to listen, but you keep yelling your deepest thoughts in their ear, then getting mad when they listen to you. You sympathize with both sides, the telepaths and the mundanes, and can recognize what a quandary humanity is in. It's this sense of sympathy that makes Susan and Talia's relationship so moving. You can feel it when Susan says, Talia says she doesn't feel like a victim, which is our first hint of Talia as control. The Psychor's subconscious personality that will be working at cross purposes with pretty much everyone from now on. Hers is arguably the most tragic story in the entire series. One face we know, representing the millions of others we will never know, all destroyed by Psychor. Every episode ends with a closing denouement, and thank the maker for our last pairing. Here, Garibaldi and Delenn. After the previous heartbreaker of a scene, this one is a necessary palate cleanser. It builds on the end of the pilot, when it's revealed that Delenn has been spending time with Garibaldi, learning about Earth customs like dirty limericks. This image of an erudite future prophet and president Watching cartoons with the earthy security chief is comedy gold, but also tells us much about both characters. Garibaldi is lonely, so lonely in fact that he's willing to spend time with someone he literally has nothing in common with, save the fact that they're both carbon-based life forms. Delenn is clearly willing to experience new aspects of culture, including those that would be considered inappropriate for a member of the religious caste, but she's just not that quick on picking them up. Our episode ends at midnight, roughly 24 hours after it began, with an exhausted Sinclair finally off the firing line and relaxing with a drink in his quarters. What does the commander wear to relax in? Civvies? No, no. He wears a sweater from his Earth Force Star Fury unit, a fighter pilot first and foremost. We also get hints about the future of EarthGov that even now have ominous overtones, closer Earth control over Mars, and, emph uh, and emphasizing Earth cultures in the face of non-Terran influences. It's difficult not to look at Babylon 5 through the lens of our own political ideologies. Full disclosure, I am a lefty liberal English teacher from California. I try not to let my politics influence my commentary too much, but there's no de denying the fact that one of the most important parts of B5 is political commentary. The election is the major subplot of episode one, and that election will have tragic consequences on Earth and the entire galaxy. Seasons one and two are a textbook in how a culture allows itself to be moved step by step into a fascist state. Start with a shocking moment, 
which leads to truncated civil liberties, a control of free press so the worst of what's happening doesn't get reported, an increase in distrust of those who are not us, leading finally to expulsion of the alien and isolation of the pure. It's happened before. It will happen again. And if Babylon 5 teaches us anything, it's that we must always stand against humanity's darker impulses, no matter the cost. I'm Jonathan Wright. Thanks for listening.